Welcome back. For our guest tonight, we are really privileged to have Jolene Tan, a writer and an activist. Her book, A Certain Exposure, is on the bookshelves right now. Jolene, welcome Hello. to the show. Thanks for doing that bit earlier, by the way. Yeah, it was fun. Great. So, you're uh, an activist for women's rights. Tell us, why is it important to have women in parliament? Well, I think we need and deserve women in parliament because laws and policies need to protect everyone and reflect everyone's interests. And uh, legislators need to be integrating considerations from women's experiences and women's perspectives into their thinking about policy, every policy, all the time. Uh, we just can't have that in our policies unless women are sufficiently represented in parliament. I see. So give us some examples. What sort of policies do we need female input into? Okay, well, I mean, obviously every woman is, has a different situation, but there are some broad areas in which uh, men and women's experiences and positions in society differ quite a lot. So, for example, women are much more likely to be primary caregivers of right. family members, whether it's children or uh, old parents or, or others, um, than men are. And that also impacts their labour force participation. Mm. So that will affect how legislators think, for instance, about employment relationships. Do they see caregiver leave as fundamental to uh, working relationships? Or do they see it as an afterthought, an exceptional accommodation that's just for women? Um, likewise, on the issue of financial adequacy on retirement, if you don't take into account the fact that many women are doing unpaid labour at home, mm -hmm. uh, you might be tempted to think about financial adequacy only in terms of CPF, which is tied to wages. Right. But that misses out a huge segment of the population. And moreover, uh, the segment of the population that is likely to uh, live for longer when they're older as well. Right, so right, these right. are some examples of how you really need to think about gender when you're making policy. Yeah, well, that's really important. Why is it then that this isn't a political issue? Why aren't parties making, you know, candidates making more of this? I think that in Singapore there is perhaps some uh, reticence to embrace the language of gender equality and rights. But certainly if you look at the media coverage, quite a lot of the parties have been asked about their uh, lack of female candidates and there have even been remarks about some GRC teams being boy bands. Mm. So people are somewhat aware of it. Uh, but if you look at some of the examples I raised earlier, uh, you know, questions of uh, CPS reform to include people who have not been employed or uh, questions of elder care infrastructure, child care infrastructure, these are political issues and they are being uh, hotly debated and widely discussed, right. even if they're not being framed explicitly in terms of gender equality. Right, right, I see. So why do you think then that we don't have more female candidates running? Do you think the parties aren't making enough of an effort? Are women not coming forward? You know, why, why don't we have more female candidates? Uh, I mean, this is a very uh, complex issue with many factors, but uh, for one, definitely parties could make more efforts. Certainly the parties that have zero candidates or, or only mm. one candidate out yes, of many. Yes, we're talking to you, Singaporeans <laughs> first and SDA. Where are the women? Um, definitely parties could do more. Um, there's also the kind of structural barriers to women's participation. There's the fact that in general, women are underrepresented in organisational leadership in Singapore. Right. So if you have a view that parliamentarians have to come from a certain level in, in professional hierarchies, then that will also impact uh, the availability of women. But I guess the, the kind of big item that affects women's participation in public life generally is caregiving, uh, both the reality and yes. the perception. So yes. the reality is that women are very often saddled with much of the caregiving burden. Policies don't necessarily support equal caregiving as much as they could. Right. I mean, paternity leave, even with the new extension, it's only two weeks. There's no way you can learn to care for a newborn in two weeks. It mm. took me much longer than that. Mm. Um, so uh, a lot of that, a lot of that domestic responsibility still falls on women, which right. makes it hard. But um, it also becomes the source of a lot of uh, perceptions of women that may also make it hard for them to either see themselves as or be seen by others as candidates for public leadership. Uh, to give you an example, uh, recently 
one of the newspapers had a series of stories introducing new candidates, four new candidates. There was a banking exec in one headline, a professor in another, an engineer in the third headline, and the last headline started mother of two. Uh, I mean, Jaslyn Go of the Singapore Democratic Party started a business that has an annual turnover of $2 million. Right. Wow. But her headline description is mother of two. Mother of two. So that tells you about how women are perceived. Mm. Um, and of course, there's all the kind of other forms of sexist coverage. Yes. Yes, the way, uh, what's her name, uh, Kevin Lin or Tin Pei Ling, the way that they've been treated has been really shocking and disappointing. Exactly. I mean, in Tim Pilling's case, uh, still five years on, people are using Kate Spade as yes. a shorthand for political incompetence, as if liking handbags disqualifies you from from doing things. I mean, I don't mm. know. You, you must have some clothes that you like, right? Or <laughs> some furniture or something. It's yeah. really difficult to see why that should be a barrier. Um, or uh, with Kevin Lim, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, hay made over the fact that she used to be a model. Mm. Um, again, as if having had photographs taken of you once has any bearing on the value of your uh, opinions or your the, the the validity of your ideas. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So what can we do then? Uh, what can I as a man, what can our public out there do? Give us one or two things that people can do right now mm -hmm. to help fight for women's rights. Okay, so there's uh, one very simple thing we can do is to try and rethink the way that we talk about women in politics and women in general. Mm -hmm. um, we can take seriously the, que the question of why there are so few women in politics and, and bring it up and debate it. Yeah. Uh, when we s are in the presence of conversations focusing on you know, Tin Paling's handbag or Kevin Lim's uh, clothing, uh, we can we can object, we can say, this isn't what we choose our candidates on the basis of, this is not how we assess them, let's talk about their ideas. Because who knows, there could be another you know, a woman in that conversation with you. If the conversation went all the way to its completion about you know, oh, bimbos and handbags, then to her that could be a big neon sign saying, politics, it's not for you. Mm. But if someone speaks up for her, she may start to see her role differently. Yes. And the people in that conversation may start to see their role as voters or as media makers differently as well. Yes, I think that's a very important point. How people treat us affects our own self-perception. Exactly. We don't even realize it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess, uh, so that's, that's, I guess, something that we can all do. Uh, if you're a bit more hardcore, um, you know, you could uh, speak up, advocate right to your MP or um, uh, go, go and visit your MP uh, and, or, or go to the candidates in your current hustings uh, in your area and ask them, what are you going to do about caregiving support? What are you going to do about infrastructure for elder care, for child care? What are you going to do about paternity leave? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and let them know that it's something that you care about yes. so that they respond. That's exactly right. I think all, all of us have to stand up and fight for our rights. You know, we can't just rely on one or two people fighting for our rights. All of us have to stand up and say, you know, we are not going to accept discrimination. You know, we want equality now. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, before you go, can you tell us a bit about uh, your book, A Certain oh. Exposure? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, this book very, was very kindly published by uh, Epigram Books last year. And it is... Uh, I guess it's always been a lifelong dream of mine to uh, publish a novel mm. or have a novel published. Um, and uh, it's a family drama that centers on two boys uh, in the family, twin brothers, and the way that their lives diverge um, and the kind of societal and familial pressures that they face. Right. Um, so I think it will probably strike a chord with many people who were growing up in Singapore in the 80s or 90s. Mm, fantastic. Yeah. I hope it does. Well, a certain exposure is on the bookshelves right now. Can you stick around for a while? We'll throw the rest of the interview up on the web. Sure. Great. We'll be right back. <laughs>